So thank you to the Kaufman family for your work and for sponsoring this panel. And this has been an amazing few days, and I'm sure everyone is just exhilarated by all the various activities. So it's an appropriate way to end a wonderful book festival that, book festival that we talk about these in, issues around um, women's reproductive right and women's equality. Um, the issues that we're talking about today have assumed a very prominent place in our media, in our public debates, especially during the recent healthcare debates, um, initiatives in Congress, as well as ongoing conversations that we've been having about economic inequality, the growing divide between rich and poor. On the healthcare side, the GOP plan was defeated by the Senate by just three votes. Two of them were, uh, were women. Um, it contained a plan to cut a key provision that um, has been important to protecting um, women's reproductive rights. Um, the plan would have cut Title X, Planned Parenthood, Medicaid, and other programs that have been providing health care for women, especially low-income women. Um, there is apparently even an executive order, which was leaked to the press. It has been made public officially by the White House um, in the works, which would allow any business organization to request exemption from providing contraceptives on religious and moral grounds. Um, right now, only religious institutions and certain corporations are allowed the exemption. So this would result in a huge decline of access to basic contraceptives um, for women. With respect to workplace equality, women on the whole still earn less than men for equivalent work, roughly 80 cents on the dollar, and women of color earn even less. Women are disproportionately represented in low-wage occupations. 59% of the lowest paid jobs belong to women. Women are overrepresented in certain fields, 79% um, roughly in health and social services, and underrepresented in others, only 43% in professional and scientific and technical services. In 2009, only 24% of CEOs were women, and they earn 74% as much as CEOs who are men. And that percentage is even lower for CEOs of the S&P 500 companies. Only 4% of those are women. And yet, despite these gloomy numbers, women have caught up with men in terms of education and now surpass men in earning college degrees. So this is a little bit information for us as a backdrop um, for our panel today. And so I would like to introduce our panelists. We have a stellar lineup of experts um, whose body of work has really helped to advance women's equality. And starting in alphabetical order in the middle, um, Dr. Willie Parker, he is an OBGYN specializing in women's health and is a reproductive justice advocate. His work includes a focus on violence against women, sexual assault prevention, and reproductive health rights through advocacy, the provision of contraceptive and abortion services, and men's reproductive rights. In 2009, he stopped practicing obstetrics to focus entirely on providing safe abortions for the women who need it the most, often women in poverty. <laughs> and women of color in the Deep South. Dr. Parker then became an itinerant abortion provider in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. He sits on the board of institutions at the forefront of the fight for reproductive justice, including as the chair-elect of the Board of Physicians for Reproductive Health. He's the former medical director of Planned Parenthood of Metropolitan Washington, D.C. He's the re recipient of the Planned Parenthood Sanger Award, an honor that Hillary Clinton received and Jane Fonda. He has been featured in Slate and Jezebel, Cosmopolitan, NPR's Morning Edition, Salon, and many more. He has been profiled in Esquire in 2014 and is a subject of a documentary film called Trapped, a film that deals with the legal battles around abortion clinics in the South. And he's the author of Life's Work, A Moral Argument for Choice, which was recently published. He's a graduate of Berea College of Kentucky um, the University of Iowa College of Medicine, Harvard School of Public Health, the University of Cincinnati, and the University of Michigan. To my far right, Professor Deborah Tannen is the linguistics professor 
um, a linguistics professor in the department at um, Georgetown University, where she's only one of six women in the College of Arts and Sciences. No, six people. Six people. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> six one people. of two women. <laughs> Six people in the College of Arts and Sciences who hold the distinguished rank of university professor. She specializes in how the language of everyday conversation affects relationships. She's published way too many books for me to list, 25 authored, edited, co-edited, over 100 articles, and has received five honorary doctorates. She has received book awards and distinguished lectureships from Princeton and Stanford, among others. Outside of the academy, Professor Tannen is best known as the author of You Just Don't Understand, Women and Men in Conversation. Sounds familiar, right? Which was one of the, it was on the New York um, Times bestseller list for nearly four years, including eight months as number one, and has been translated into 31 languages. Several other books have also made the, the Times bestseller list, including Talking from nine to five, women and men at work. You are always mom's favorite. You're wearing that, question mark. Um, her book, The Argument Culture, is especially relevant to events happening now as it deals with public discourse and the ways the media frames or misframes issues. And her latest book is You're the Only One I Can Tell, Inside the Language of Women's Friendships. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, an MA in English Literature from Wayne State University, and a BA in English Literature from Harper College. And last but not least, <laughs> attorney Jillian Thomas is a senior staff attorney with the Women's Rights, um, Women's Rights Project of the American Civil Liberties Union where she specializes in equal employment opportunity. She previously was a senior trial attorney with the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and at NOW, Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she specialized in litigating employment discrimination cases on behalf of women in male-dominated jobs like construction and law enforcement. And she's also worked in private practice, including at Vladek, Waldman, Elias, and Engelhardt, PC in New York. She's the author of Because of Sex, One Law, 10 Cases, and 50 Years That Changed American Women's Lives at Work. She's a graduate of Yale College, the University of Michigan Law School, where she was a contributing editor of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law. And after law school, she clerked for the Honorable John T. Nixon of the US District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee. So those are our panelists. And I have lots of questions. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys have questions of your own as well. So we're going to get started. So I'd like to start with sort of defining the problem as each of you see it. From the perspective of your own experiences and expertise, what do you see as the major obstacles to women's equality with respect to workplace issues and or reproductive rights, whichever you, way you want to answer those. So I will be. Um, starting in 1991, I wrote an op-ed that I called The Hillary Factor. Sorry, 1992. At that point, Hillary Clinton was the wife of a candidate for president. And what I called The Hillary Factor is what I've since uh, called at the time and have written about since as the double bind that confronts women in positions of authority. And I think this is one of the major obstacles, so I'll just quickly explain how it works. A double bind is worse than a double standard. A double standard means that women are held to a different standard than men. And that's unfair and it's wrong, but you can meet that standard. A double bind is a situation in which you have two requirements, but anything you do to fulfill one actually violates the other. Women in positions of authority confront two sets of requirements. One is what is required of a woman, and the other is what is required of a person in authority. Anything they do to fulfill what we expect of women 
Uh, be self-deprecating. Don't put yourself forward. Uh, ambition is a dirty word. Um, I actually, side point, and I bet I wrote about this uh, in, in, during the um, primaries. I Googled the name of each of the candidates and the word ambition, and it was positive for all the guys. Bernie Sanders had an ambitious plan for something or other. Uh, Donald Trump had um, was an ambitious real estate uh, developer. For Hillary Clinton, it was it was next to evil. I mean, it was uh, what <laughs> I, sh I should have prepared by reminding myself. It was everything evil you can think of associated with ambition uh, was associated with her. Uh, how could anyone exactly reach that level and not be ambitious? But it's a, it's a requirement for a person in authority. It is damning for a woman. Um, she's supposed to never want to put herself forward. Um, so she's going to be violating our expectations for a person in authority. If she does all the things that a person in authority has to do, be decisive, be confident, uh, tell other people what to do, because that's part of your job as a person in authority, we know all those words that start with the word be that then hover around her head. Uh, and she will be judged negatively. So if she talks as she's expected to as a woman, she isn't respected. And all this, by the way, grew out of a book that I wrote called Talking From 9 to 5 about the workplace. Um, women were not getting promoted. And any time a woman wasn't hired, wasn't promoted, I would ask why. She just didn't seem confident. They'd be seen as less confident and less competent than they really were because they were talking in ways they expected they were expected to as a woman. Uh, if they talked in ways expected of a person in authority, they were respected, they were thought to be good at their work, but they weren't liked. Um, and, and this is, I believe, one of the vices in which women in public life are, are caught in. And so it was, something, it was a, something I observed and developed in my work on the workplace, but it is equally applicable to um, certainly candidates for public office and um, women in public life. So I think the double bind is, is a huge one. And it's ways of talking. I mean, that's why maybe I'll just add one little PS to that. Um, so the book that I just wrote, which I was talking about here, is about women friends. And uh, one of the things that I um, encountered in interviewing women was how frequent it was for girls to have very, women to have very painful memories of when they were in middle school or high school, and a group of girls would suddenly expel a member of their group. And um, w one woman was telling me how guilty she felt that it was a girl she was very close to in middle school, um, and in high school, her, the same group kicked this girl out, and she said she really didn't deserve it. Um, what she recalled was, she was cute, she was good at sports, and it's true, in high school, she was making friends with the girls in the higher grades, but she really didn't deserve what we did to her. And this just was astonishing to me because in a group of boys, the one who is physically attractive, good at sports, is the, high, is the most admired of the boys. His status goes up. But there is a real tendency for girls to turn on a girl who seems better than the others. And she gets accused of being a snob, of being stuck up, um, thinking she's better than us. Um, and uh, just my last thing here, um, I just was, saw a um, play in New York and there was a character there who's singing a song based on a real character. This woman was the first pilot, first woman pilot at American Airlines. And in the song she's saying how she, you know, it was her first uh, time in the cockpit and the male pilots don't want to be there with her. They say a girl shouldn't be in the cockpit. And the flight attendants also turned on her because they were saying, you think you're better than us. So, and I think that is a lot behind the I just don't like her that you got about Hillary Clinton and that I understand people are saying as well about Elizabeth Warren. So when I think about uh, in my role as a women's health provider, the empowerment of allowing, or at least me facilitating women controlling their fertility, it also becomes an economic issue because uh, the reality is if women don't control their reproduction, they don't control much else about their lives. And so when we fetishize motherhood and we 
assume that the most primary identity of a woman is to bear children, uh, it makes whatever decision she make against that either illogical or immoral. So she's either uh, feeble of mind or not fit of spirit. And so that means that uh, economic issues, reproductive issues become economic issues. And so um, the, uh, in my mind, uh, when uh, we, uh, I get solicited often in the advocacy I do around uh, uh, making the case for, rep for abortion and reproductive rights, I get solicited for the tragic narratives where the woman was really sick or the pregnancy was really abnormal as if a woman making a decision not to become a parent when she's not ready is not a valid one. And given that women, when they participate in public life, they often have to do double duty. So if you're a doctor, you also have to be a mom, such that uh, the roles of home life aren't shared. Uh, it makes perfect sense, and it's totally rational, if a woman has aspirations for a life beyond motherhood, that she would decide not to do double duty. So it really becomes an economic, it beca if you look at the fact that a woman understanding what goes into being a parent and what the expectations are of her with regard to home life and if she aspires for a life outside the home, uh, that she makes the decision not to do double duty makes her decision to control her fertility uh, one of uh, uh, rational thinking around the expectations that are imposed upon her by a society that fetishizes motherhood. And it's just, uh, it also makes her, um, uh, it, it should fall in the realm of her having the empowerment to control all the processes that go on in her body, whether it be an economic decision, a health decision, or merely one, a question of her quality of life. Yeah, my reaction, especially as an employment attorney, I think kind of synthesizes what um, Deborah and Willie have said. For instance, the, the lack of women in leadership roles, meant, sometimes due to outright discrimination, obviously, but also due to these subtler forms of uh, resistance to uh, um, appointing women as leaders or following women as leaders, has a trickle-down effect in terms of um, compliance with laws, hiring decisions, HR procedures, um, accountability um, in terms of diversity within a workplace. So, so lack of women at the top has a lot of ripple effects. Um, uh, Tara r referenced the the pay gap, which which we all know. We all know the the eighty nine cents on the dollar for um, for or seventy nine cents on the, on the dollar. Excuse me, I got a little I got a little excited there, but no, it's seventy nine cents. <laughs> Um, uh, but that's much, much lower for women of color. Uh, uh, Latino women don't until October of the following year catch up to white men from the previous year's earnings. Um, and that really is due to a lot of factors, but uh, including discrimination. Um, but a major one is, is sex segregation, um, um, that, that women in this country, um, especially women of color, continue to hold the lowest paid jobs, the part-time jobs, the jobs with no benefits, the jobs with no sick days, um, the jobs that may not even be, uh, maybe for smaller employers and may not even reach the threshold for the number of employees needed to be protected by the federal laws against discrimination. It's where the women who don't speak English or might not be documented are laboring um, in great uh, insecurity, um, whereas um, men tend to be concentrated in jobs held by other men with higher wages. Um, and women who attempt to break into those worlds, if they're lucky enough to receive the training or the support to try to break into those worlds, um, are met with a great deal of pushback, much of which um, Deborah has described in her work um, before, the idea of someone who's a strange, you know, who's an only who's, a, who's uh, segregated in some way is a, is a target. Um, but there are really depressing studies showing that when men enter female-dominated um, jobs like nursing, that n the men make more than the women do. And when women enter male, high-paying male-dominated jobs, uh, uh, wages go down. So there's a central devaluation of women's work, uh, much of which is care work. Um, you know, we could we could go on and on about about that. And 
Um, but I, I think that, and then the final um, matter, again, which, which Willie touched on, is the issue of pregnancy and motherhood, especially, again, for these workers who are in jobs that have absolutely no maternity leave. They work for employers too small to qualify for the Family Medical Leave Act. You have to have 50 employees, or they haven't worked for a year under the Family Medical Leave Act. And P.S., who, ha who can take 12 weeks of unpaid leave um, when they're making minimum wage? I mean, no one can. Statistics show that uh, it's only about um, 60 percent of our workforce that's covered by the or eligible for the FMLA, but about half of those don't who are eligible don't take the leave because they can't afford to take unpaid leave. And so, really, there are um, you know millions of women in this country who are just a paycheck away, or just one sick child away, or one pregnancy away from losing their jobs altogether. So it's this real economic insecurity stemming from not just lack of um, access to uh, dependable reproductive care and being able to make those decisions, but then also once they have children, paid leave, quality child care, um, you know, health coverage that will keep them and their kids um, well. Um, and so it's, it's a cycle that's unfortunately quite pernicious to break. So I'm going to go to a question that I think is on the mind of a lot of people with respect to the Supreme Court. Um, there's a lot of concern for both supporters of abortion rights as well as foes of abortion rights of, in terms of, and reproductive rights more generally, not just abortions, about uh, the next appointment um, to the highest court, um, which can make a huge difference in terms of threatening Roe v. Wade. Um, at the same time, while a lot of attention has focused on the future nominees, and we, uh, women's reproductive rights um, being eroded, um, actually they're already being eroded without um, overturning Roe v. Wade. So I'd like for you guys to talk about um, the future of the court, but also what you think of, about what's going on right now, even outside of Roe v. Wade, even while it's still in place. Well, I can tell you uh, the functional gutting of reproductive rights at the lower court levels, I call a devolution uh, in terms of starting with 2010 and the Tea Party sweep in response to President Obama's election, along with that sweep of the uh, and uh, making the legislature, the federal legislature, more conservative with the Tea Party. It ushered in uh, an era where states, uh, uh, the governor, the governors, uh, the governance of states flipped. Uh, so governors became more conservative, more Republican governors. Uh, whole legislator, legislatures flipped so that at the lower levels you had what's happened at the, you had a, we have a president, uh, a, um, a legislature, and increasingly the Supreme Court that's all in the line so that there's now no more balance of power. At the state level, what that's looked like has been the passage of, an, on average, 90 to 100 laws a year that functionally gut the provision of Roe, whether it be waiting periods in Mississippi is 24, Alabama is 48, Louisiana uh, is 72 <coughs> hour waiting period once you decide that you're, once you seek an abortion, there's no funding uh, in some states based on the Hyde Amendment. So uh, there are, uh, uh, there's the requirement to give uh, women seeking abortion, medical misinformation, or outright lies. For example, women in Mississippi are, are required to be told that abortion increases their risk for breast cancer. So there are all of these things that are, are uh, functionally gut the provisions of Roe, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, made it uh, more difficult so that even irrespective of what um, the uh, happens at the Supreme Court and in, in anticipation of the Supreme Court uh, uh, shifting, uh, there are what have been put in place what are called trigger laws. And these trigger laws mean that when uh, the day that, uh, that uh, uh, the road decision is overturned, abortion will automatically become illegal in those states because the laws are written in a way that they're contingent upon the uh, status of Roe. Wow. So uh, there's just at the lower level uh, the uh, uh, making, although abortion remains legal at the highest level as the law of the land, 
it, become, it becomes uh, practically inaccessible. And John Oliver said abortion can't be theoretically legal. It's either legal or it's not. And it's the only way that happens is if there are providers in access. And, and I'm a little out of my depth here because my specialty is employment rights. Um, I did speak to my colleagues at the Reproductive Freedom Project before um, coming here, and I, er, I commend to you the ACLU's website to read more about their victories because actually there's a, a blog that I'm looking at here that, um, that came out on, on Thursday saying, believe it or not, it's been a good week for reproductive <laughs> rights. Uh, it was mainly um, cata cataloging various awful laws, um, like Dr. Parker is referring to um, that have been sort of beaten back, but I, I think I think the you know things like and an, um, access a law regulating women's girls access to abortion in Alabama, where um, usually there's a parental consent. Um, uh, excuse me, a judicial bypass workaround to a parental consent law. This one required that a teen go through a trial to prove that she was um, capable of making this decision for herself. Um, P.S., if she's not, should she be having a child? But um... can, I, can I give you another little coloring detail to that? That, that law, in the specifics of that, uh, every state that has a parental notification has to have a judicial bypass. But in this particular case, in Alabama, they had made it possible for the court to assign, assign a, a, a representation to the fetus. It's called a guardian ad litem so that uh, the state could have a compelling interest and could uh, adjudicate that fetus's right to, con to be born. Uh, and so that statute struck that down. So I just thought yeah. the coloring details about that were a bit yeah. more interesting oh, than yeah. what, it, what it meant. Yeah. Um, and in Arkansas, um, there were a number of laws that we managed to get enjoined. Um, it, as, as my colleague uh, Bridget Amiri puts it in her blog, they were a grab bag of one insulting, harmful restriction after another, um, including uh, a ban on a particular abortion method, um, including um, uh, uh, a requirement that a woman get permission from her, or sorry, just notify, it wasn't get permission to notify her partner, even if he were her rapist, before she have an abortion. Um, um, in Kentucky, um, there was a uh, there was a sort of a throwback of um, radical protests blocking the entrance to a clinic in Kentucky. We haven't seen that kind of activism since since the 80s. Um, but uh, uh, and so an injunction. Thankfully, now we have a federal law called the Federal Access to Clinic Entrances Act law, face law that uh, the Justice Department. I can't believe this, but the Jeff Sessions Justice Department did file a lawsuit um, success prohibiting this. So, I mean, it's just a game of whack-a-mole, really, um, with these kinds of measures um, that are coming up. And I, I'm not speaking for the ACLU when I say this. I'm saying this as an observer being asked to give my opinion. I think when we look at, at these kinds of laws that are so intent on shaming and being punitive about, um, about unintended pregnancy, um, in a country that has no, you know, cohesive or coherent approach to affordable um, contraception, in which this administration is actually talking about removing the federal mandate for uh, employers to provide contraception for any objection they may have, not just religious. Keep your eyes peeled. That's coming next. Um, that also the a recent ACA debate and and discussion of contraception altogether is about is about sex and it's about shaming women for being sexual in a non procreative way and all of these assaults ultimately get back to that and the idea that a pregnancy that you are forced to bear a child as a punishment as a punishment is the most warped way of looking at f family values or what that child is supposed to mean in this world it's to, to care that much about punishing women, I think, is a really terrifying, terrifying thing. Uh, I'd like to add something about language here. Um, the first thing I want to say is how honored I am to be on this platform with Dr. Willie Parker. Um, if there is a definition of hero, I believe you are a hero. And it's related to what I'm going to say about language, that the far right has been successful in 
in demonizing the very word abortion. Uh, unfortunately, the terminology pro-life is far more successful than the terminology pro-choice. Everybody is pro-life. It, it implies that if you're not on their side, you're against life. What could be more valuable than life? And choice has two problems with it. One is it sounds frivolous. Um, we're constantly offered choices about, you know, what kind of coffee you want. Do you want latte? Or, um, and it's a euphemism. And by being a euphemism, I talk about message and meta message, it gives you a meta message. It implies that the word is so terrible you can't say it. And that adds to this, uh, to the shaming. Um, my sister is, was the director of a, of a Planned Parenthood of Mid-Hudson Valley, and she really raised my awareness of this. Even people on our side say, well, nobody's in favor of abortion, as if it's a given that this is a terrible thing. Uh, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Why? Um, if you look at the, uh, and again, it was my sister who pointed this out, did you ever see uh, the details of cataract surgery? <laughs> it's gruesome. <laughs> it's awful. Should cataract surgery be rare? Because it's gruesome. No, if people need it, they should have it. And so there's this, I think it's really been um, pretty widespread successful to demonize the very word abortion. And I almost wish we didn't say we were pro-choice, but could say we are pro-abortion. We believe there should be a right to abortion. <laughs> What's uh, been useful uh, is to uh, take choice away from being a noun and convert it into a verb. It's like choice is a part, actually, a part of choosing and deciding. Uh, and that's why uh, what's taken, what's gained a lot of traction is a broader framework rather than a legal framework of rights, a one of rights, health, and justice incorporated into the concept of what's called reproductive justice. And so reproductive justice makes possible to think about reproduction in form of a, in a continuum. And it takes into account other reproductive outcomes like assisted reproductive technology, abortion, adoption, miscarriage management, surrogacy, and a whole bunch of other things that are now a part of the term reproduction. And so there's been a real fight around people whose identity, are in the, they are vested in the terminology because it feels like an indictment when you say, we should no longer talk about pro-choice, we should talk uh, have, a com uh, have a term that is more expansive. So there's, to, in short, there's some gang banging that's happening within the reproductive rights, reproductive justice world around, I've been doing this work for X number of years and it's why, why do we need to change the name now? But to your point, language is important and so we gotta figure out not how to fight, but how to fight fair because what we cannot do is uh, have this battle that ultimately uh, results in, in strengthening patriarchy, because patriarchy is really the issue. Yes. Okay. Just what, what, one quick PS about, about the language. It may be too late to, to, to change it. Maybe that's just the word okay. we've got. But just a quick anecdote about the problem with it. A student of mine wrote a paper. Uh, she was pro-choice, and nobody else, it's Georgetown University, a Catholic university, no one would admit to being pro-choice, but when she interviewed them, they would say they believed that abortion should be legal in certain situations. And one student said, well, it isn't a choice, it's a necessity. Hello? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So a lot of attention has been focused on conservatives and Republicans, but Democrats should not be left off the hook. Um, the Democratic Party leadership just recently decided that it will support um, and fund anti-abortion candidates if necessary during the 2018 congressional midterm elections. Um, so filling seats with a D behind the name, in other words, is going to take precedence over women's rights among liberals. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and even Bernie Sanders have all supported the idea of not using a litmus test, litmus test with respect to reproductive rights. So the question is, is there such a thing as a bridge too far in the Democratic Party with respect to reproductive rights? What are the trade-offs? 
I think uh, I'm still trying to figure out what a, a, a pro-life Democrat is. Is that is that a covert Republican? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And not to your point to 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 not to make it partisan, but the I was I was uh, very taken aback by the dis the decision of the Democratic National Committee to decide whether or not they were going to be able to out Republican Republicans, um, and this whole notion of deciding that abortion or reproductive rights is a losing issue is, uh, I think, old hat for you got, you got your ass handed to you on a plate, and you can't figure out what happened. Uh, and women and reproduction are not the issue. They're not the losing issue. Um, but to me, sometimes when you talk about something spot on, it's harder for people to appreciate because they shut down. And so the, the analogy that I thought of is, if the Democratic National Co Committee and the Democratic Party is a boat, and reproductive rights is a plank in the hull of the ship. Is reproductive rights a plank in the hull of the ship or is it a mast on a speedboat? If it's a plank in the hull of the ship, if you pull it up, you're gonna sink the boat. But if it's a mast on a speed ship, on a speedboat, it means that if the wind is not blowing, we still have a means of moving the boat, so you're optional. And so I learned from an old girlfriend, she said that never make somebody of priority who makes you optional. So the question is, how can, uh, how can uh, the, the Democratic Party have as its core message that we are the party that supports women, we are for reproductive rights, but then equivocate on something that's as essential uh, as the economic empowerment, whatever else you want to make as an issue of the Democratic Party that you want to champion, it's all rooted for women who are the majority of the population and their ability to control their reproduction. So either say you're for women or not, but don't equivocate. Yeah. Right now we have one party in favor uh, that supports reproductive rights and one stridently opposed. If the party that's supportive becomes, uh, starts to equivocate, we're gonna have one and a half parties against reproductive rights and a half party if any effort at all. And so either say you're for women or not, personally, I'd rather lose with women than win without them. And that's got to be the position. It's a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with him. I'm with him. I, okay. I do have a personal anecdote that speaks to that. Mm -hmm. and. I mean, I so agree with you, but maybe this will cast some light about why they behave the way they do. Uh, two other linguists and I were invited to address a gathering of Democratic senators. They get together apparently twice a year in private to talk about policy and whatever. And uh, one of them was in charge that year and he thought they should get control of language. Uh, we were supposed to do for the Democrats what Frank Luntz does for the Republicans. Um, and we worked really hard on it, and we worked for months, and they didn't listen to us anyway. So, that, But at this meeting, I talked about this. I made the same point that I made now with more detail and more examples, um, that the term pro-life was a better choice of words than pro-choice. Um, Nancy Pelosi was furious at me. She came down on me afterwards, like, really angry, and she said, I am keeping so many of the Democratic senators in the pro-choice fold by the skin of my teeth. And if you convince them that pro-life is more magnetic to people than pro-choice, I'll lose them. It gave me, and I was devastated to think that I, you know, here I am trying to do good in the world, and, to, and I felt like it was a real lesson to me to keep my mouth shut when I don't, <laughs> understand the situation that, that I'm in. But it really did give me an appreciation of what, what the Democratic leadership is up against. Um, and and it, probably a lot of it is Israel politic. But opinion polls show 70% of Americans yeah, I know. support access to abortion rights in most situations. And then I, I garbled this statistic yesterday and I meant to look it up, so I'm gonna gar and I didn't, so I'm gonna garble it up again. But my understanding, you probably know it, is that at, at least a third of American women by the time they're 40 have had at least one abortion. And the same women who have abortions overwhelmingly are the same women who have children. 
those are the concepts to to unify into the democratic vision, not jettisoning an issue that is central to half of its membership. And I feel very betrayed. How many women are in the leadership board of the Democratic Yeah, I think that's probably part of it. I think, and that gets back to that issue, right? We need the leadership to be, you know, diverse. diverse. Diverse, not necessarily in in sex, but diverse in thinking. Let me let me throw let me throw let me antagonize a bit. If you can embrace the notion that feminism is a body politic and it's not about your biology, so then as a man I can be a feminist. It shouldn't be lost on you that there are female patriarchs, yes. and that there are women who benefit from the system as it is. Well, that's true. And and fifty three percent of them demonstrated it when they voted for Donald Trump, yeah. right? because they had to decide whether or not being white or female would be their empowerment. Being white has worked for them all of their lives, and if they chose to be empowered by having a woman in the White House demonstrating the ultimate hurdle around slaying uh, white male privilege, then now they have a new enemy. They no longer have white men to pedestalize them. So I'm saying, don't think that just because there are more women in the leadership that they're necessarily going to be feminists in their politics and their thinking. And I'm not making an argument against them, but account for the fact that there are female patriarchs as well. And so what you should be more interested in is what are their politics, but it's what, what's between their legs. A couple more. Okay. A couple more questions. So gender discrimination persists in the workplace, um, which impacts not just individual women, but their families and of course our entire society. Everyone is harmed by gender discrimination. But to take um, the title of our panel today, why are we still talking about this? And so how do we reframe the conversation around gender equality in the workplace more effectively to achieve the kind of social change that we would like to see? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> uh, or I'll try. Um, not to be a, a broken record, but I think that um, women's absence in leadership roles is a huge part of this problem because so much of what is holding women back, I mean, I talked about structural inequality, which is, which is huge, and that's the fact that the majority of workers in low-wage jobs with no benefits and no security and nothing, and the fact that they are majority women of color is something that has so much more to do th than just with the workplace. So it's, uh, that's sort of another huge conversation. But in, in terms of when we're talking about um, women getting passed over for promotions, women making less vis-a-vis uh, -vis who's sitting next to them, sexual harassment, which we haven't even touched on and remains just an epidemic, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's, it's not having women in leadership and not having men in leadership who are prioritizing these issues. Um, I mean, I, uh, you know, I was talking to Alan Arfa, um, who uh, I don't know if he's here anymore, but was, you know, is at Paul Weiss, which is the firm that's been looking into the f dealing with the Fox stuff. Once an investigation started, the floodgates opened. And women came forward, and and people were fired, and people <laughs> got forty million dollars severance packages, and um, you know mixed messages. But I'll take Ailes being out of there than having him there. And um, you know it, it it takes taking action, and that means also. And I said this yesterday, so I'm sorry that I'm repeating myself for people who heard yesterday's talk, but. This, these issues about women's equity can't be just women in rooms talking to other women. That is, serves a therapeutic purpose, it serves a strategic purpose, it serves a, an important information sharing um, and strength building purpose, but in terms of t writing this ship and turning things to be different, we have to have male 
people in charge who really are committed to this and don't just say it and don't just sign pledges to do things, but really make it part of evaluations of other managers. How well do you promote you know, diversity within your teams? Um, how well have you dealt with complaints of any sort of harassment or discrimination that's come forward? Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and making it part of your performance as a manager, how you manage, how you manage and how you, how you f promote equity. Um, uh, one other thing I'll say, and it's sort of on the same theme, but on the issue of, of pay, tr the lack of transparency around pay, again, putting the structural factors aside that, that put women into to low wage and minimum wage and part-time work. But within a particular workforce, lack of transparency is a huge contributor. Because, I mean, think about it. Who among you knows what the person in the next office makes? Think about who among you knows what your best friend makes. It's, people don't talk about it. It's totally um, verboten. Half of American employees work for an employer where they're either explicitly or um, implicitly discouraged from talking about um, their pay and fear they're going to be fired if they do. And so, um, and a lot of times employers don't even know. So my hat is off to the employers, most of them in Silicon Valley, who I think are trying to combat their very well-earned bro um, reputation and, um, and sexual harassment, uh, reputations as, as hotbeds of sexual harassment by m mandating self-audits and subjecting themselves to pulling back that rock and looking what's underneath it and then dealing with the consequences. And one of the most interesting kinds of equal pay laws that are out there um, right now, I think, I, I, I have mixed feelings about them, but I think is kind of interesting, is, is laws that, I know one of them was just actually considered here in Massachusetts, laws that um, if an employer does a self-audit and discovers gender disparities, that if it takes concrete steps to remedy those disparities, they, the results of the audit cannot be used in litigation for a certain period of time. So in other words, so I mean, I'm always af afraid of anything that gives immunity or inoculates against you know, a discrimination lawsuit, but I think it's an interesting idea to try to, I hate using this as a verb, but incentivize employers to look at what's going on right under their noses and fix it. I think one one concept of uh, to piggyback on something you said that how to how to get more uh, men engaged and let me kind of uh, recalibrate something when I said white male privilege uh, that was not an indictment about against anyone born white or male but it was to dem to talk about the demographics that create power inequities that you have to think about and divest of. Gloria Steinem gave me a, a fair trade apparel bracelet that gave me a concept that just kind of blew my mind and I'm still chewing on it. And it says simply, imagine if we were all linked and not ranked. Imagine if we were linked and not ranked, which is to say, when we think about the ways in which we're put in hierarchical relationships, Imagine if we could deconstruct those. And when you think about that, whatever your particulars are, I can rattle out four identities that I hold right now. I am black, male, Christian, and heterosexual. Uh, neither of those metrics or demographics is the problem. It is the relationships around them. Being white is not the problem. Racism is. Being male is not the problem. Patriarchy is. Being gay or straight is not the problem, homophobia is. And so when you figure out the way in which you're in empowered, you have to deconstruct those relationships. So with regard to the role of men, patriarchy is the issue. So how do we make men think about divesting of power that they hold based on just being born male? You have to make it a human rights issue. Men have to understand what patriarchy costs them. We know what it costs women, but what does it cost us? at a deeper level, it costs you a part of your humanity. In order to devalue your woman, you have to lose part of your humanity to do that. So my notion of how do we get men to care, uh, rather than just filling the room with women, again, filling the room with people whose politics are feminist and egalitarian and equal, you have to make it, them understand what uh, exploitative relationships cost them. 
Otherwise, chivalry doesn't work. It doesn't have enough substance to kind of make men move in a way because chivalry in many ways is self-serving. Mm. I'm thought better of if I'm chivalrous. But if I'm engaged in human rights, I do like Abraham Lincoln said, he said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master in why he freed the slaves amongst other things. It is to say you have to want for other people what you want for yourself. And if we're going to ask men to want for women uh, a world that women want to live in, those men have to want for themselves, want for women what they want for themselves. One, one last question and then I'll throw it open. Let's, let's may, maybe end on solutions. Um, and maybe if you could talk about um, things that you think we could do individually, collectively to address gender um, inequities, do, if you have any inspirational examples you would like to share or anything that you feel really optimistic about. Anyone feel optimistic? <laughs> uh, one of the things I feel optimistic about that's I think uh, uh, an effective model for social change that because it's such an effective model is being vilified and, and, and being viciously attacked is the Black Lives Matter movement and particularly in the way it's structured is not it's not, uh, it's not uh, heteronormative, it's not male-centered, uh, it's, uh, it's not hierarchical in terms of uh, people who've been doing civil rights for a while and now they're the, the go-to people. It's really a decentralized style of leadership that is intersectional in its analysis of problems. It's about uh, carceral justice, it's about uh, shackling and pregnancy, it's about a whole bunch of yeah. other things. So, I think I would offer as an example, even though it's being vilified and attacked, is a decentralized model of social change like the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> joking aside, because obviously it's very easy to get, um, feel sort of beaten down these days, but I actually um, would build on that by saying the, the outpouring of everyday activism that we have seen since the election is so unprecedented and is so heartening. Um, and I think the key to it, because it's a marathon, not a sprint. That the, I mean, and we're only, we're only six months in, everybody. <laughs> it feels like years and years, but it, we're only six months in. And the way to um, keep your eye on the ball, I think, is to be, um, be directed to what, it, what you are most passionate about and what um, keeps you energized. Um, for instance, I'm not a march person. I'm not someone, I, you know, I went to the Women's March, but then there was a march like every single weekend for a few <laughs> weeks there. Now, some people, that's valuable, that getting those people, those feet on the street and those aerial pictures of crowds of thousands and thousands of people, those matter. That's not what's going to move me. Um, and, you know, so, so picking a particular issue and choosing to be activist on that issue, there is so much that's going on at the state and local level in terms of legislation because DC is just hopeless. And so there are so many um, great bills being introduced uh, in state legislatures and city councils about equal pay, about paid family leave, um, about pregnant workers' rights, um, uh, you know, get activists about around LGBT, you know, rights and, and anti-discrimination measures. Um, I, I think also, um, I, I am putting in a plug here to check out the ACLU's effort called People Power, which is sort of the, um, the analog to Indivisible, although the Indivisible people are phenomenal as well. Black Lives Matter matter is phenomenal as well. Um, and what pa people power is trying to do is to channel people around the country into exactly the kinds of efforts that are right for them. And it could be when there's a hate incident in a community to send a bunch of people to the mosque or whatever was the target and, you know, meet with them and just extend olive branches. I mean, the, the kind of sort of self-care and other care that we need to be doing, I think, is part and parcel of the activism that we also need to be pursuing. I will be really, really brief. Um, one has to feel optimistic thinking about the progress that has been made in the area of gay rights. Um, I'm old enough that my best friend who is gay, uh, I you know, lived through his going to therapy to get cured because that was what people did at that time. 
his own therapist saying to him, you know, when I go down the street and I see someone I, who's gay, I know it because cause they won't look me in the eye. Jesus. A therapist. Um, and to see gay people getting married and it's public and Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, is marrying a gay couple, I think one has to realize progress can be made yes. and that's at least an area in which yes. we can be happy about that. That is very true. Um, and just real quick what we can do, since I started with a double bind, uh, when you feel yourself reacting negatively <laughs> to someone, ask yourself, especially a woman, ask yourself if would you react in the same way if it were a man saying the same thing and doing the same thing. For example, not smiling. <laughs> Great, thank right, you. Thank you.